we will be presenting our final presentation for Project A Living Impact. My name is Zachary Eaton, and I'm joined by Kevin Cortapassi and Henry Kramer for the team that developed the Living Impact. Should you have any further questions after the presentation, feel free to speak to us directly or contact us using any of the information provided here. Now, I would like to introduce Kevin Cortapassi as he presents our targeted subject matter. Thank you, Zach. Our focus for this project was public housing, and in order to understand how to create successful public housing, we first look to existing or previously existing projects. Uh, and the stories of the people who have experienced it. In this case, we looked at Vital Neighborhoods, uh, a visitor over the, uh, over the years by Alex Kotlowitz for the stories of the people who have lived in public housing and as it exists currently. Alex Kotlowitz is a journalist who wrote about the times he visited Henry Horner Homes, a Chicago public housing unit uh, complex on the west side of Chicago, uh, built in 1987. When first seeing the conditions of the development, he stated that he trembled at the state of things. Uh, now, this was not out of fear, however, this was rather out of a sense of shame for the complexes. He simply could not believe the state of the facilities compared to the surrounding city of Chicago. It was as if he had uh, stepped into another world. He believed that the high rises were simply too massive, too ignored, and too underfunded to come places where people could thrive. He also noticed, however, that these places uh, were very rich, vital neighborhoods that brought life to their communities. Homes often felt as they belonged to something, and these places became lively and spirited. The residents couldn't imagine living anywhere else, even with the quality of the facilities as they stood. However, as the facilities continued to decay, the lack of funding and quality began to weigh on the growing uh, communities as criminal activity became prevalent. People began to isolate themselves from each other in an attempt to protect themselves from violence and crime, allowing the quality and state of the facilities to define the community identity, eventually resulting in the collapse of Henry Horton Homes. As the buildings came down, Alex Kotlowit noted that no matter how the buildings looked, they were homes to people when they uh, had made communities and memories in these places, even before the nature of the design resulted in the death of those communities. This death led Kotlowitz to describe them as essentially tragic. At its peak, these public housing developments had roughly 200,000 people living in them, and over the matter of a few years, they came down one after the other. Former residents were still struggling to uh, obtain ideal public housing in their place, and this search for ideal public housing became our target goal as we wanted to make a living, vibrant, community-driven public housing facility to meet everyone's needs. Well, Kotlowitz saw both the vibrance of the community, he also saw the problem with public housing as it was currently manifested, specifically the conditions. In order to create public housing without falling into the pitfalls common to this type of project, we looked into the research and principles presented by Milton Freeman. Milton Freeman was a prominent economist was a prominent economist and was awarded the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1976. In working to address this specific area, Milton Freeman developed three fundamental principles that must be applied to make development successful. First, in a free market, there is always some housing immediately available for rent at all levels. Second, the bidding up of rents forces some people to economize on space. And third, high rents act as a strong stimulus for new construction. To best be able to properly create this new construction, Milton Freeman suggests that the spaces created be dynamic, effective, cultivate pride, and show the path forward to future attainment. To demonstrate an example of Milton Freeman's concepts, we are going to compare two of the works of post-war Germany, specifically public housing developed in Krupen War, Germany, based on the principles brought forth by Milton Freeman in comparison to East Germany housing developed by the Soviet Union. Using principles of Milton, uh, Milton Freeman's public housing ideas to create a project that embodies the concept of a space that will be dynamic, effective, cultivates pride, and shows the path forward towards attainment. In order to develop this, we need to identify the problems specific to our site. Thank you, Henry. Now, due to our 
location at 2525 South Michigan Avenue in Chicago. We straddled the border between the Southern Housing Zone and the loop in downtown Chicago immediately to our north. This point functions as a divide not just between these locations and their cultures, but also as the divide between poverty levels. As, de uh, as depicted on the prior slides, which show poverty levels, um, it depicts it basically that the poverty level to the south of our site is relatively high for low income, while north of our site you see uh, pretty much on the border. Uh, of our site's location, you see immediately to its north and a sharp increase in income levels and a lowering of the poverty in the area. Uh, continuing on to our next slide, as depicted here, we looked at the energy consumption, which again, our site falls into a kind of divide point um, where south of our site, uh, the light blue is indicative of uh, relatively low energy consumption levels, while north of our site, you see very high energy consumption levels. The orange dots are major offenders, uh, locations that have their like buildings that have very specifically have very high energy consumption. Uh, so these kind are two kind of major key points that we wanted to uh, counter in our development. Uh, however, we wanted to continue into facilities that were surrounded at, near our site, uh, specifically in our zip code, starting with police stations of which we have three in or around our zip code. However, the closest one is Central, which is the station to the north of our site. It is separated from our site by a major interstate, interstate here. Uh, this causes some difficulty in access into the southern portions of our site, um, causing issues with crime rates in the area. Uh, continuing into fire, uh, we have a singular fire station located. It is a single engine facility located uh, south of our site. The image here is marking just that there is a singular one in the zip code. It's actually quite a ways south of our site. Uh, moving into libraries, we have two within the area, though we only have one in the zip code, though it is only about a block and a half away from our site. Uh, the other one is on the other side of our interstates, uh, but it does allow us to engage with the library facility. With grocery stores, we have several of them that are to the northwest of our site. However, they are all separated by interstate or the river itself, uh, meaning it's very difficult to access grocery uh, stores or fresh produce in the area. The closest and easiest to access is actually the Jewel Osco to the southeast corner of our zip code. Um, however, uh, it's still quite a ways away. So that was one of the things that we wanted to address specifically within the development of our site is access to fresh produce and groceries. Uh, we moved on to education, of which there's quite a bit um, available within our zip code. However, we wanted to specifically focus on the Graham High School, located to the north of our site, only about a block. Um, and we also wanted to look at Drake Elementary School, which is located uh, immediately adjacent to that public library that we spoke of earlier. Uh, continuing on to green space. Uh, Locations, part 540, excuse me, uh, is located immediately to the northwest of our site. With a little bit of interstate, it is a fully developed site with um, parks, uh, a football field, and a track. Um, while Dunbar, which is 22 acres, is closer when you get south of our site, it is undeveloped. Um, it's basically just a big flat field. So unless that is developed by the city, we felt it was actually more viable to uh, associate with and integrate into Park 540 while leaving it open for the development of Dunbar Park. Uh, in terms of the greater context in our surroundings, we have kind of four key facilities or areas that uh, have a heavy impact on the development. The MTA track and field, which was that park I spoke of, Park 540. Um, Dearborn Homes is existing social housing or public housing just to the south of our site. Um, immediately to our northeast is the McCormick Center, which is a large facility, both visually and in terms of engagement with tourist activities. Uh, and then the Bronzeville development, which is breaking ground this year, is a new development in the area. Um, and will integrate uh, several large-scale development housings, education centers, 
uh, and research centers into their uh, into this uh, large open area where that is uh, currently aban an abandoned hospital. Within the local context to our site, we begin to look at the immediately adjacent hospital on our east side that we share half a uh, block with, and then the other half of our site is immediately adjacent to a series of restaurants. Uh, again, the McCormick Center is depicted there in the top right in that bright yellow color. As you can see, it's very heavy and in terms of relationship to our site. Uh, while the uh, NTA track and field is this green park depicted here, and then other restaurants and health centers along with that Graham High School are depicted in this image as well. Uh, looking at our human scale activity and connectivity to its surroundings, uh, you can see in this image on the top left here, these are Divi Bike Stations, of which we have one on our site. Uh, Divi Bikes, for those of you who don't know, are the rental bike system within the area of Chicago. Um, and relating to that, we have the uh, accessibility at 30 minutes in the bright pink around that image, and then in an hour range in the dark blue. Uh, similarly, the pedestrian version of that is depicted here on the bottom left, and then on the bottom right is all existing uh, bike paths and pedestrian paths in the surrounding area, uh, both along the lakefront there as well as how it associates to the southern road of our site. Thank you. In terms of environmental factors, we have a relatively high access to solar gain due to the southern arc of the sun path with a maximum azimuth of 72 degrees in June and a minimum of 25 degrees in December, while our primary wind directions pull from the northeast and southwest respectively. Uh, again, the solar access is quite high due to the fact that there are not very many particularly tall buildings to the south of our site currently, uh, though we do have some that will be built in the near future. While temperature in the Chicago area stays relatively lower, uh, resulting in a much higher number of heating degree days, this leads to many of our decisions revolving around heating of the facility and ways to optimize this cost. Finally, the images depicted here show the site as it stands now. Uh, currently made up of two large parking lots uh, on the either side of Michigan Avenue. Uh, with minimal green space engagement, though there is some along either side of Michigan Avenue itself, the, the parking lots themselves do not have much of an engagement. Uh, it should be noted that the northeast corner of our site, which is shown in the far right image, top image there, um, is access to underground parking for the existing hospital. And it will be kept in the final design. Okay, based off the collected data, we began to develop the individual facilities necessary to meet the requirements of the site. On the lower floors, we focus on public engagement facilities, uh, with core facilities being the market space, the retail space, and the grocery store space, uh, as well as many other uh, public engagement spaces like the auditorium and the spa. Uh, as we look to the third and fourth floor, As we look to the third and fourth floor, we uh, continue to see the public spaces grow uh, while transitioning into more semi-private uh, spaces, uh, continuing on to the fourth floor, so that way we don't merge the public and the actual residents of the building uh, too much. Uh, with areas such as laundry mats, uh, uh, reading lounges, and libraries, as well as daycares, uh, all consisted on the third and fourth floor. This helps tenants. Uh, easily leave and enter the building uh, as, as needed. Okay. Finally, as we move into the fifth floor and up, we move into the more residential only spaces. The varying kinds of housing units inter interspersed uh, with floors to facilitate all types of lifestyles and community engagement. And we'll go into all the residential floors in a little bit more detail on the future slide here. So next, we worked on bubble diagramming. To help give an understanding of how our building would sit on site, as well as how different components of our master plan would interact, we created bubble diagrams that were then layered over our site. Our diagrams show the building footprints and how they interact with the movement avenues we created. 
It also shows the rationale behind the placement of specific buildings on site, such as the placement of commercial units next to pre-existing off-site economic developments, or the hotel in a position to best facilitate movement between itself and the off-site hospital, and the McCormick Center. It is also important to note here that as the height increases, the development condenses to form the main triangular shape. Next, we create bubble diagrams for the four different types of residential units we have in the project. Those being the three bedroom apartment, the two bedroom apartment, the hotel rooms, and the studios. These concept forming actions helped us lead towards the development of our final form. In terms of form development, we moved into our initial master plan, which was derived from the work presented in the location specific bubble diagrams that Henry just presented. Uh, the connection lines are aligned to match each, each other, creating the walk paths, uh, connecting the various facilities as depicted in the yellow dotted lines, uh, while the um, bubbles themselves are formed to more accurately reflect the square footage required for these facilities, as well as creating unique spaces such as uh, cutting off the corners of the triangular forms to enhance kind of engagement spaces at those corner intersections of walkways. Uh, now, as we moved into the proper development of the form itself, based off of that master plan, if it will go. <laughs> Thank you. I'll put that over there. Uh, Starting from the initial floor plan, we began form, uh, began form development by extruding the various facilities to heights uh, both relevant to the amount of space that we wanted uh, in the surrounding facilities, while the three core facilities uh, at the corners of that kind of interior triangle are extruded to roughly about 40, feet, or 40 stories in height. This matches the Bronzeville development heights that will be used uh, in the next coming years, as well as several other developments that are being built in the area or are uh, proposed currently. Um, this also allowed us to account for the amount of housing that we would need to uh, counteract the overcrowding in our zip code currently. Now, the issue with having facilities that are that tall is they are very imposing on the site, being 40 stories in height. This uh, makes it very uncomfortable to hang out in those areas around it in the green spaces that we wanted to develop. So we took the third and fourth floor and extruded them out uh, creating a visual separation between the towers themselves and then the outdoor spaces on the ground floor. Um, however, uh, it still feels very monolithic in form. So in our fourth stage, our height variance, we begin to modify the heights of those towers, increasing them slightly or decreasing them by quite a bit, uh, both to increase solar gain on the, each individual tower, increase visual access both to downtown Chicago and the lake, as well as um, varying the edges of the third and fourth floor engagement to kind of break up that visual extension of the singular lines and punching holes through the third and fourth floor both to allow daylighting into the ground floor, as well as to create a visual connectivity between heights. Uh, from there, we used a iterative, iterative solar gain manipulation, uh, which we will explain in the next slide, to develop our tower forms to more accurately reflect its surroundings. Uh, we began that by voxelizing the form uh, or breaking it up into a series of volumetric cubes. Uh, and then we varied that and cut out some removal of some of those cubes uh, to enhance the solar gain both in the courtyard space uh, as well as creating a human scale engagement within the towers themselves. Uh, we then integrated a twisted form that varies uh, roughly 10 degrees uh, to the left or right to optimize uh, solar gain as well as visual cues to different key locations in its surroundings. Uh, this uses a diagrid form and a series of specialized solar panels that have allow visibility through them uh, to create these kind of atrium spaces, both enhancing solar gain within the facility, the towers themselves, as well as some visual cues. From there, we applied green spaces as depicted in image six. Uh, this is done both on the tops of the third and fourth floor, creating a large scale park space that is raised above the green space engagements and outdoor engagement spaces uh, at grade, while also punching roughly three story tall uh, green spaces into the towers themselves to continue all the way through, except where the vertical circulation is located. Uh, 
these sort of green space parks within the towers themselves allow for the uh, concept and push of the concept of vertical neighborhoods, uh, which is the idea that with 40 stories it becomes difficult for someone who might be living on floor 38 to engage in green space engagement down on grade. So we create large park spaces that allow for connectivity and community engagement uh, with uh, a healthy environment and ecology within the vertical height of the tower itself. Excellent. Okay. Moving into our solar performative analysis, we took the base form, uh, which is the original towers, and then the image in the immediate right here is the courtyard space between the towers. Um, this got us a total of 38,941 megawatt hours in the towers themselves and 15,666 megawatt hours in the courtyard. Uh, from there, we created the initial voxelized form and then used an iterative uh, AI system to uh, optimize it, uh, creating voxel2, which generated a total of 41,892 megawatt hours in the tower themselves while increasing the courtyard space as well. However, um, it should be noted that the voxel2 actually loses some solar optimization on the tower to enhance the courtyard space compared to the original form. So we wanted to counteract this using the twisted form that I was speaking of earlier the diagram structure, uh, which is why we added to the twisted form. Uh, again, it started about, at about 28,000 uh, megawatt hours, uh, which we then enhanced with the same uh, performative iterative uh, AI system to enhance it up to 30,769. Uh, combined, there is some slight decrease since the twisted forms were optimized for the entirety of the twisted form. Um, but our final came out to 44,323 megawatt hours in the towers with the courtyard coming out to 17,792 megawatt hours. Then this then is what we came to as our final solution in terms of form development. Uh, as you can see, uh, the towers as they existed, uh, the outer spines, which do not get modified very much by either the twisted form or the voxelized form, uh, which that would be this back spine on each of the three towers. We decided to add a kinetic facade uh, to help kind of control the solar gain on those spaces, um, while bridges are used to connect the towers themselves at each of those green space heights that I was speaking of earlier. Uh, again, this is the southwest isometric, the northwest, the northeast, and the southeast. Notably, the northeast shows the main entrance to our facility there. Uh, we kind of share a large green space engagement with a main entry drop-off point uh, with the hospital. Okay, and here we can see the daylight analysis for the first four floors, as well as the typical daylight analysis for the residential floors uh, for both summer and winter. Uh, this would be for all of summer uh, on top of the first four floors. So we did this in order to find the necessary locations to punch some of these holes to make them a little bit bigger, smaller. Uh, and also it helped us uh, identify places where we needed to add artificial lighting as well as shading devices. Um, so for the garage, we ended up adding a different type of facade uh, as well as to the south face to actually decrease and uh, decrease the amount of solar radiation we'll see uh, on the inside. Uh, the floor plans here shows the floors and how they relate to one another. The ground floor has many market type facilities uh, while slowly progressing to more private facilities as you go up uh, the floors. Um, the tenant rooms uh, and hotel begin on the fifth floor. Uh, and this is an example of the 16th floor and a 19th floor bridge connection right here. And they go all the way up to floors uh, 40 and the top floors on tower two and tower one are reserved for uh, penthouse uh, <laughs> rooms and everything like that, as well as the tower three having a small overlook to the south side of Chicago and the river. Okay. Here's a closer look at the first floor plan as much more detail of each individual room. Uh, the restaurant and gallery were pulled to the side to enhance to show the typical sides of each space and how the different elements of the building come together. <clears throat> as we uh, can see, the more public fun spaces are off to the left-hand side of our site 
in order to keep most of the public engagement away from the hospital facilities as we do have ambulances that are coming down the side of the street. So keeping more people engaged on the left-hand side of the site and still allowing them to come through and enjoy the rest of the building uh, was key part to our design. <clears throat> Moving up to the third floor, we can see the how the largest space works uh, together. The retail and grocery store have been enhanced to show the connection between the two. Uh, the third floor has full access to the grand entry and all three of the towers equally. Uh, you can walk around the entire surrounding of the floor uh, through the whole middle. Um, and each section of the building is actually technically its own section uh, for fire safety reasons. Uh, there is green space and many educational areas for both the tenants and the public to use. Uh, the emergency crew areas are also separated from the rest of the facility, uh, as we thought it would be important to uh, keep them separate, yet have them able to still walk around. So we key carted them off um, and allowed them to have their own individual space for emergency situations. This, uh, this slide is showing the floor plan for the typical residential and hotel plan. Uh, the room, hotel rooms are relatively simple in design, having typical floor furnishing and a modern take. Uh, the hotels come in two different sizes, both a single bed, as shown here, and a two bedroom uh, for those who need more space. Uh, the residential spaces are also shown. These are typical of what you would find throughout the towers. These plans uh, have been designed in a way to meet everyone's needs of both space and light. The towers offer many different uh, size rooms, up to three room apartments. Uh, here in the bottom right, we can see two different configurations of a two bed apartment and a single configuration of a three bedroom apartment. Each room has necessary items to, to require happy and healthy lifestyles. Uh, the, uh, the residential towers offer a multitude of different lifestyle options and each room can be customized to uh, fit a specific need. Uh, this slide shows a typical bridge floor plan, and as we can see, the residents have full access to large open grief spaces all throughout the levels of the tower. Uh, we can also see uh, how the tower cutouts can affect the room designs on Tower 1 and the hotel. These bridges uh, not only allow for the connection between each other, but also offer a new space to relax as you walk uh, by and as you can see in the city of Chicago. So as I'm talking about the Cutouts actually affect the way our rooms are designed and uh, offer many different varying type spaces for each individual's needs. Okay, moving into the structure, structural design of the building, we begin to see how it's put together. You can see in the image that the three towers consist of two main concrete cores running along the short base and the long base on the inside. The ground floor consists of a large cast in place concrete element that spans across the entire road down here. Uh, and it wraps around all three of the towers to provide more stability. Uh, the parking garage consists of a full concrete structure with a single triangular beam design pattern, as noted down here in this section. Here is the, we see the structural column plan with the sizes of the grid and the spacing of the vertical elements. The three towers all have the same consistent framing plan to keep construction uh, relatively simple and, and design as they go up. However, the beams all have to be custom made uh, to fit certain sizes with the cutouts. So that was the only challenge we saw uh, with the structural elements. Uh, the parking garage will be able to be built quickly to help alleviate the parking issues as construction takes place and uh, as we take over the parking spaces of the hotel. And then showing the grid plan for the residential units alongside the diagrid structure, uh, we can see how the two systems relate to each other. The diagrid is connected through the plan of space, both to the core of the building and to the actual beam and steel frame design. Uh, this allows uh, more stability on all three sides of our uh, tower structure. Okay. 
looking at the structure and, and elevation shows how the vertical steel framing and the diagrid support the force. Uh, the steel frame is made up of W-shaped elements that get smaller in size as the time before. This goes the same as for the diagrid structure as well. The diameter begins to shrink as we uh, begin to move up. Uh, there are also 3D section views of the tower showing the whole structure and how it comes together. Uh, and as I'm saying with the diagonal structure, we really added this element to help uh, lift the outside faces of the floors, uh, as we didn't want to have too many columns running straight through the actual tenant facility or tenant rooms and things like that. <clears throat> And these are more structural uh, sections to give you a more in-depth look at uh, how everything kind of comes together. This is uh, Tower 1. Uh, so this is as well Tower 1, just facing uh, the north view, and this was the west end section. Showing a little bit more detail on how the structure looks with the rest of the building. Okay. Uh, these are the three more most important details in regards to the structure of our building. Uh, the picture to the left shows exactly how our green spaces will be working on our roofs. Uh, this allows us to actually plant larger, uh, not huge trees, but ornamental sized trees uh, that can be placed on those three story spaces in between the towers to help give people a little bit more uh, greenery and uh, to be able to actually have trees 40 stories high. Um, the bridge detail shows how exactly how each of these bridges is connected. Uh, they're supported by uh, a simple steel frame that kind of runs across, and it is a twisted concrete form that has glass panels in between that you can look by as you go across. And as we see on the right is a typical foundation plan. Um, we don't have a wall foundation. Uh, we use isolated foundations to kind of support uh, our building, and this just shows a little bit of how everything comes together. Okay, and then this is a detail of our wall section and our roof, as well as our facade and stairs. Uh, we combine them all into one little section for you. Uh, the facade being used is made up of these gap panels. It helps actually reduce the CO2 and traps it, um, minimizes the emissions. Uh, from the building. And many of the panels have uh, special AORS domes that we place to produce electricity uh, from the sun. Mostly in these plenum spaces with the ceiling. Now to speak to sustainability and materials. For materials we will use in our development, we have made a specific effort to select sustainable materials where appropriate, and no material in our selection appears on the red list. Materials of specific note include carbon cure concrete, a new type of concrete that traps the CO2 created in the process of forming, and saves approximately 25 to 40 pounds of CO2 per cubic yard. Electrochromatic glass to make the living spaces more dynamic. And Aureus panels, a new development of passive solar energy gain that can collect energy even without direct sunlight. For sustainability systems, we have included systems for water management, such as green roofing and water collection, energy generation with the Aureus panels, and further active and passive systems to help address the challenges provided by the site environment. These include vertical geothermal, double skin facades, and kinetic facades. These systems will help with our goal to place our development on the path to LEED certification. We expect to get high marks in the category of location and transport with considerations to high priority site, surrounding density and diverse uses, access to quality transit, bicycle facilities, and reduced parking footprint. In the category of sustainable sites, we addressed use of open space, rainwater management, heat island reduction, and light pollution reduction. Another focus of ours was on the category of indoor environmental quality, where we looked to score well in the indoor air quality assessment, thermal comfort, interior daylighting, daylight quality, and quality views as well as, as, well as acoustic performances. Now to address specific aspects of AIA design for excellence. With consideration of resources, we use materials that, where possible, are reclaimed, or barring that, the most sustainable options available were chosen. 
For ecology, we wanted to create a green space in the plan to help counter the mass concrete normally seen in cityscapes. As a part of that, only local area plants were used in our landscape, such as white birch trees. In designing for energy, we looked to use multiple techniques to reduce consumption, from fundamental design decision, decisions and elements, such as the twisted double skin facade and the voxelization for solar gain, to building systems, such as vertical geothermal and aureus panels. When considering designing for equitable communities, we looked to engage the surrounding areas to our development and one of those areas was the existing hospital just next to our site. We wanted to make our development readily accessible to both those patients, visitors, and site residents. In order to do this, there are many different options to move in and around our development for maximum use of the site for those with disabilities. We also included a number of areas to work with for the local school system and community. By providing tech centers, galleries, and an outdoor amphitheater, we will help to bring the surrounding communities onto our site. To tie into that, designing for discovery, we have the tech center and the gallery spaces to allow for learning opportunities for as many people as possible. Thinking to address designing for integration, we took into consideration the surrounding area and human scale concerns. We adjusted the height of our development to match that of the Bronzeville development and broke up the building in the first two stories to allow for a more human scale integration. We included green loops, green roofs, and water collection systems to help with designing for water concerns. Our project is designed to adapt to the community and the culture in and around it with large multi-use spaces and public venues designed for the change that is inevitable over time. This development has many considerations for economic design, from the restaurant and bar near pre-existing economic developments off-site, to the gym and spa to work with the nearby hospital, to the grocery store to help alleviate food deserts, and to the public marketplace for smaller starting entrepreneurs, to the hotel positions to take the best advantage of those who would be at McCormick Center, the economic development, not just, not just the economic development, but for all of the surrounding areas as well, were taken into consideration. Finally, for the consideration of well being on site, we ensured that there was a, a dynamic light both inside and outside of the development, broke up the first two floors for human scale, scale interaction and walkability created multiple green spaces and open air locations, and created areas focused of focused interaction to create vibrant spaces. We made sure to control the levels of sound in our development as well as wind speed and gave as much control over the personal environment as possible with systems such as the electrochromatic glass. Thank you. And now we're going to move into some detailed imagery just to kind of give you an impression of what it would feel like to be walking in and engaging with the site. Uh, what we started with is this image as you would see uh, as you were coming out of the marketplace zones and the grocery stores. Uh, this is that amphitheater that we were speaking of earlier uh, and kind of how this engages as you're looking south of the site. Um, you can see how we have integrated uh, benches, uh, water features, green spaces to break off and uh, kind of isolate this from Michigan Avenue so you're not getting a bunch of noise uh, bounce in from there uh, on top of using sound control panels above the interstate itself in the, that are put into the form itself over, over the top of it. Uh, you can note the distinctive use of unique and uh, interesting columns to uh, make it feel as if you can reach out and touch the facility, like it doesn't make it feel like the building itself is above you, uh, but rather that it's uh, interactive and it engages you. Uh, moving into our next image here, this is what it would what it would look like as you are leaving the spa, going towards the main entrance to the building, uh, or also as you're coming out of one of the tunnels that accesses it from the other side of the site. Um, so this is on the east side of the site. To your left of this image, just off camera, would be the hospital. Um, as you can see here, we use the edge of the cast in place form that follows that to kind of uh, break it up and create a distinctive access point uh, at the center of the site with heavy, uh, fully developed green spaces along those edges, um, a taxi drop off lane, as well as a main wraparound lane for the uh, main entrance there. The parking garage access is that building uh, directly in the back there. And to the left here is a fully developed uh, large scale ecology green space uh, that would both allow access from the hospital uh, folks to engage in a healthy environment, as well as um, the folks from the clients for our facility. 
moving into our main entry from the east view. This is a similar image, but this is from that uh, green space that I was just talking about, looking towards the main entry to our building. Uh, it similarly uh, shows these kind of seating arrangements and uh, these awning spaces and pavilion spaces engaged into this uh, developed uh, green space. Uh, while you can see access both to the green spaces on the top there, where you can see the edge of the railing, as well as you can see the beginning of the towers themselves. This render is of me, the Michigan Avenue entry. So that grand entry space that I was just showing you entries, entries from the front, this is that access from the Michigan Avenue side, which also has drop off points uh, for, bus, for the bus line that runs along Michigan Avenue there. Um, this has more uh, water engagement as well as green space engagement. We have a glass roof top there to allow uh, solar access into the space while also allowing people, especially on that top space there, uh, this would be function as the uh, playground space with the daycare center on that third floor. Um, so that allows them to kind of engage with those bottom floors and see the vehicles traveling underneath them. Um, while you have direct access into the space um, with these panels being a unique type of panel that allows for some uh, audio control from that road. This image is of the engagement both with the existing restaurants that would be in those masses to the right there, uh, while this is the west side of our building. Uh, this has both seating areas, green spaces. Uh, we broke up the third floor engagement, so it's not all a singular long line, uh, making it feel more engaging and interactive rather than, uh, rather than uh, imposing uh, with a manipulated uh, facade form on the front of the gym space to kind of help control vis uh, visibility engagement between the gym and the um, more eating areas, outdoor eating areas, both from the restaurant uh, immediately behind this camera view to the left, as well as the restaurants across the street. Uh, notably, that street is an existing alleyway. We would like to convert that over to a bike use lane uh, that would tie into the bike lane that runs along the south part of the site that is already existing and connects to the bike lanes that run into the park at 540 that we spoke of earlier, the NTA track and field. This image uh, is showing a similar spot, but it shows access into tower one from the left here. Uh, this is basically the other side of Michigan Avenue uh, from the other image that I showed uh, earlier, uh, looking north as well. To the left lane here would be access into the marketplace zones as well as out to the prior images um, kind of bike lane road um, while continuing on to the north there, should you wish to. And then lastly, this is the south view of the whole building um, as you are entering into downtown Chicago. And then the fourth floor outdoor southeast view, this is showing kind of engagements on that third and fourth floor. Uh, we have integrated ramps that tie between all of the different heights at various points throughout it. So it feels like a singular um, green space engagement throughout the entirety of the site rather than several different heights of green space. Uh, we wanted it to feel like it's a park, even though it's on top of a building. These are our resources. Okay. And to conclude, uh, the Living Impact intends to address all the common pitfalls seen in public housing design, as well as socioeconomic, environmental, and cultural issues found on in or near our site. While so creating a unique environment within surrounding metro areas that function to engage and supplement the local community through social connectivity and interactive ecological environment. The combined impact of these design aspects will lead to the legacy and growth of and vibrance in the communities through the living impact. We'd like to first thank Professor Nettie for all of his time uh, and effort he spent helping us uh, refine this project, and to all of you for being there and supporting the invitation to the entire thing and helping us along the way. We would also like to thank you for listening to our presentation, of course, and now we will be open to any comments, questions, or concerns that you may have. Thank you.